Hello and uh, welcome to this special edition of the TSE Digital Economics Conference. So the organizing committee composed of Jacques Kramer, Dan Hershoff, Paul C. Bright, who's on sabbatical this year, uh, and myself, we are very happy to offer you this special Zoom session with two excellent keynote speakers, John Van Rinen and Giacomo Calzolari. We, of course, would have preferred to welcome you in person, as was the initial plan. But judging by the, the large number of registered participants, uh, this event is much more than a consolation prize. So the, the first presentation today is the Susan Scotchmer Memorial Lecture. Susan was a professor of economics and law at UC Berkeley, a brilliant theorist and a leading scholar in the field of innovation economics with pioneering contributions in particular on the question of cumulative innovation. As I'm sure many of you, I, I have learned a lot from her many papers, especially on cumulative innovation, characterized by simple yet illuminating theory and from her wonderful book on innovations and incentives, which I encourage you to read if you haven't done so yet. Susan was also a friend of TSC, and many of us in Toulouse keep fond memories of her frequent visits and participations to this conference. This year, we are delighted that John Van Rinen has accepted to give this lecture in memory of Susan. John is the Ronald Coase Chair in Economics and School Professor at the London School of Economics, and one of the best economists working on innovation and firm performance. He will talk about the rise of superstar firms. But before giving the floor to John, let me just remind you of two things. First, the lectures are recorded and will be posted on our website. And second, you can ask questions using the chat and we'll try to keep a bit of time for Q&A between the two lectures and at the end of Giacomo's lecture. So without further ado, John, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me just see if I can get my slides up, let's see, so you full screen, uh, can you, is that, can you see that, uh, Alexander, is that clear? Yes. Great, yes. fantastic. Okay, so, well, um, first of all, I should say thanks to everybody for coming here, um, and, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I can't be in Toulouse, I'd have loved to come to, uh, the beautiful city of Toulouse, where I have a lot of a uh, lot of uh, happy memories. Um, but uh, next year, hopefully, uh, that uh, we'll be able to do this. So uh, I, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the rise of superstar firms and causes and, and consequences. And I'm really delighted that this uh, is in memory of, uh, of of Suzanne. Hang on, just get this. Uh, yeah, uh, of Suzanne, who um, you know I knew I knew well when. Uh, when she was with us and, um, you know, she gave me lots of encouragement, especially when I was a, a, a more junior person. And one of the things actually, which was, you know, just, just mentioned was that she has this fantastic book on innovation and centers. And when I first started teaching courses and the economics of innovation, there wasn't really a, a textbook you could use apart from Suzanne's. It was a really excellent introduction to the whole field. So that, this was like the kind of core text back then when I first started uh, teaching courses on innovation uh, economics at, at UCL uh, many, uh, many, many years ago. Um, so, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an overview of, of issues around superstar firms. I'm going to draw on uh, lots of different ongoing work with several co-authors. In, in particular, uh, you, you may know there's this work with David Orta from MIT and, and Larry Katz and Dr. Patterson and David Dawn on superstar firms, the labor share. So I'll draw on some of the ideas in that, but I'm also gonna be drawing on our ongoing work in that area with David, and also new work with uh, Jan de uh, for the Deaton Inequality Review that I've been working on, which you know, Jean Terrell has kind of given me lots of comments on. Also some new work with Mary uh, Amiti from, uh, from the New York Fed, uh, other, and many other people. I'll just mention this has also been inspired by these annual conferences I run with Chad Syverson, if you're interested, please apply. Uh, we have one every year on, on mega firms uh, and on the kind of you know politics and economics of, 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 of very large firms. Okay, so I decided to do this, um, uh, you know, to make this the subject of, of, of the talk today, partly because of this headline that I saw in Forbes at the beginning of the year, which uh, you know says that Apple became the first company worth three trillion dollars greater than the GDP of the UK. So, you know, that's, you know, partly that's Apple doing very well and partly that's the UK doing very badly over the last uh, decade or so uh, or more. Um, but 
in either case, it's very, quite a remarkable fact. And, you know, of course, it's not just Apple, which has this, uh, you know, very large um, footprints. Um, uh, Microsoft is worth about two and a half trillion dollars. That is all the beginning of this year. Uh, Google is worth about half of uh, two, just under two trillion. Amazon, 1.7 trillion. And Facebook, uh, just under one trillion. So, um, you know, these are sometimes called the GAFAM firms. I like the phrase GAFA because in, in uh, London Cockney slang, GAFA means boss, your kind of uh, patron. But uh, these are like boss firms. These are the big firms of the, of, of the world economy. Now, growth of these firms has been kind of supercharged by COVID as so much as, as we're speaking now has moved online and also in terms of retail and other kinds of activities have moved online. But, you know, the growth of these firms obviously predates the pandemic by a long period. And, um, you know, part of what we want to do is to understand what's going on uh, in terms of, you know, the, the reasons for the rise of such superstar firms and also the consequences. Now, I know um, give a bit of an introduction, talk about what I'm going to call increasing differences between firms, look at some markups. And then I'm also going to link this a bit with uh, work on imperfect competition and product market and labor market, which I think is one way to kind of frame these questions before giving some assessments and some brief policy conclusions. So the kind of first thing, of course, to uh, emphasize is that the growth of superstar firms isn't just a phenomena in the kind of classical digital sector. So as important as the kind of GAFAMs are, I'm going to argue that it's a much more general phenomena that we see in many industries. And, you know, the, you know, the increase of, um, you know, the, the, the footprints of these type of firms has raised the concern that maybe product market power is generally increased. And this may have potential welfare costs in terms of living standards, such as high quality adjusted prices and therefore lower real wages perhaps negative effects on productivity growth and innovation, and finally effects on labor markets, such as the falling share of uh, workers and value added, and also maybe increases in inequality. But the kind of concerns, of course, are broader than those more economic concerns. You know, there's also concerns around the future of democracy, such as if some, many of these very large firms can lobby to shift the rules of the game. There's concerns of privacy. I'll touch on the, these, uh, these last ones, but not very much. My focus is more going to be on the the more standard economic kind of issues. Um, you know, the, the reason I got interested initially in looking at this area was the fact that, um, you know, what I've exploited to myself in much of my career is this explosion of microdata, which we've been fortunate enough to have. We live in this golden age of data, really, with the opening up of administrative data sets and uh, private sector databases on companies. And this has enabled the documentation of huge cross-sectional differences in terms of firm size, in terms of productivity, exports, management practices. And of course, you know, this, this, uh, there's a long tradition in economics about this. So I put uh, Robert Gibrat here of the law who did the kind of classic work in the 30s on firm inequality and maybe lesser well-known Francis Walker, the first president of MIT, who uh, in the first edition of the quarterly journal of economics argued that um, a lot of the differences that we see in, uh, in, in performance are related to this wide heterogeneity of management practices. So management practices, for example, the work I've done with Nick Bloom and Rafa Sadden and others has documented very big differences across firms of productivity. I've highlighted the most important country in the world here, France, uh, as well as a few other countries. And what this diagram shows you is just the uh, variation, this is just the histogram of our measure of management quality uh, that we've done in the World Management Survey over, over many years. So firms um, at the left tail, you know, say with schools of less than two, are firms who are basically not collecting data or information on the inventories or things happening at the firm. The company's not setting any sensible goals the company's not promoting or paying people, or hiring people based on effort and ability. It's amazing how these firms manage to exist and persist in, in a modern market economy, but they, they do. Um, so this heterogeneity, not just of management, but in a range of productivity, is a really first order fact that we need to understand. And you know, this has had a big influence throughout fields of economics. And obviously, it's always been critical to I.O., but I think it's now generally accepted in most economic fields, like in trade, the Mellets model, labor with some of the you know, new models I'm going to describe, 
you know, linking wages and, uh, and labor shares to for heterogeneity. In macro, think of Shane Clement and so on. Although, so although this, I think, has been accepted and has influenced economic fields, less well known and understood is the fact that these big differences have actually been getting wider over time. And one of the things I'm going to show you is that, you know, this, these differences, both in terms of size and some other dimensions, have actually got much larger in the US and, 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 uh, and many, if not most, other OECD countries. So one dimension of this, and this is the thing I'll mainly focus on, is kind of concentration, uh, industrial concentration, the relative um, size of uh, sales of firms and industries, which has generally increased since the 1980s. Uh, secondly, and related to that is the fact that if we look at agora markups, prices over marginal costs, harder to measure, but those also seem to have increased over, over time since the early 1980s. And these, these factors, I'm going to argue, can be, can be used to help understand some labour market changes, such as the fall of the labour share of, of GDP. Now, there's an important caveat, Emsa Biobewer, that these are moments of the data. So linking these changes, these positive changes with welfare changes uh, requires more assumptions and more models to understand that. And obviously, we, we, you know, we understand that a lot in terms of thinking about you know, what the relevant market is and what, how we link concentration to other measures. But so you know, this, these are things we're taking into account, I argue, clearly, but not having got a trivial relationship to welfare. You have to think about it more harder than, 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 than just documents to get. Now, what are some of the explanations for these changes that's going to rise in, in, in uh, concentration of markups? Well, there's several different stories um, which we'll talk about. One, I guess, I sometimes call this Google or Apple story. And this is to do with the increased importance of platform competition, um, you know, network effects. And this is you know, core to the digital economy, the kind of industries we've talked about, the firms we're talking about, which is happening in digital markets. So that's, that's clearly part of what's happening. But you know, I argue it goes beyond that. So you know, even if I call this the Walmart story, because even if we look beyond those digital markets into markets which are which are more about the use of new technology, these also appear to have the same kind of trends. And I think to understand that, one argument is what's happening is that you know you could think of this as the increased importance of fixed costs. So, for example, uh, if intangible capital such as an ICT and software has become more important. So this has a big fixed cost component. The larger firms are going to be better at using that because they're larger, they've got larger scale, and this will give advantage to kind of bigger firms. So, um, you know, I call this a Walmart story because if you think about retail, then, you know, in many parts of the retail sector, you have dominant firms, superstar firms like Walmart. And one of the reasons Walmart is very successful is it's been able to invest um, hundreds of millions of billions of dollars in software systems, which enable it to track its inventory as it moves across the world in global value chains, and also have kind of just-in-time inventory management control, which can enable it to change the product mix that it has in different stores and through distribution centers around, around, around the world. And, you know, there's no way a kind of uh, smaller independent chain can do that, least of all a small mom and pop shop. So that's part of the story uh, that you might have the you now one bit of you know that's an anecdote, but one bit of kind of systematic evidence comes from this nice work by Lashkari et al. On, on French data, which shows that the kind of relative intensity of the use of software compared to other forms of investment increases very sharply with firm size. These larger firms are much more kind of uh, uh, software and IT intensive than other types of firms. Um, so that's the second story. A, a, a third or fourth story relates, I think, broadly around competition. So I think the most common story about why things have changed that, that you often read about in the media is to do with falling competition. So people often immediately assume that these changes of uh, concentration and increase in markups are due to the fact that uh, competition has fallen, and particularly um, due to the weakening of antitrust enforcement that you hear a lot about in the US, weakening competition policy, allowing too many mergers, too much anti-competitive activity. So um, Tom Philippon has argued this uh, strongly as many as many other authors. So that's certainly a possibility, and I, you know, I, I'm going to show you in some sectors that might be true. But there's also a kind of, you know, argument that things may have been gone in the opposite direction. So with globalization, with lower communication costs and trade liberalization, these are forces which tend to allocate market share towards the more efficient firms. Think about the Mellet type of model. And, you know, if that's the case, you can actually generate a lot of these patterns through actual 
positive changes in competition. So you can imagine that if globalization has become more important and superstar firms uh, are more efficient or more innovative, producing better quality products, more activity shifts towards those larger firms, that will increase concentration. And you know, if the, that reallocation of force is strong enough, that can also increase aggregate markups. So um, I think that's something which we'll, we'll look at as well and, and have some, some evidence for in some, some markets. So many macroeconomic models now are, are trying to take um, some of these facts and put them in um, informal models. Um, so I mentioned a few of these, these, these examples here, including colleagues like you know, Martin Gerida and Philippe Aguillon. But I think that, um, although I think as useful as those activities are, it may be that this, what, this kind of one kind of model of the macro economy to fit all the facts may not be right. And an alternative um, way to think about this is there may be different explanations happening in different parts of, of the economy. Uh, and, you know, that's, you know, I, I, do, you know, I think this needs to be more worth thinking about that kind of alternative approach to these rather than just to have a you know, single macroeconomic model explaining all the facts. Because if that was true, that would be great if we can get a compelling macro model to do that, but that may be more challenging than it sounds. Okay, so let me start off with giving you some more facts uh, just about the data. So if we're thinking about, you know, trying to measure relative size of firms, the nat natural thing to do is just to think about, you know, jobs. So I downloaded, this was like, you know, about a week ago, the latest data from the US which were from the kind of uh, late 1970s, we can track uh, the fraction of, of jobs in large firms. So this is one measure of that. What this line shows you is the fraction of all jobs in the US who are in firms with more than 5,000 employees. There's about 2,500 firms out of the 5.3 million firms in the US who are in this kind of you know, superstar firm category as defined by more than 5,000 workers. Um, and, you know, as we know from the Givrin onwards, um, you know, there's a power law in firm size. So these small number of firms, 0.03% of the U.S. economy, of number of firms in the U.S. economy, employ a lot of people, over a quarter of all people, about 28% in the late 1980s. But the startling thing is by the eve of the pandemic, the fraction of workers who are in these firms had risen very dramatically from about 28% to 35%, so seven percentage points. So that's a very you know, startling and large increase of the number of people working in these big firms. That's the kind of simplest possible measure of the increased importance of, uh, of these superstar firms. Now, you know, a pr several problems with this. One problem, of course, is that employment may not be a very good measure of the footprint or the importance of these, these large firms. Um, you know, I, I, I've been to the uh, Google headquarters and Mountain View a couple of times, and you know, one of the striking things is you know, how relatively few people are kind of employed in a company like Google compared to how important it is in terms of its influence in the world. And you know, my uh, my former colleague Eric Bridgelson often calls this the phenomenon of scale without mass. And many of these uh, firms are very large scale, but without the mass of having a large number of workers. Now, some of that is because the workers are outsourced, you know, either domestically or, or, or foreignly. But a lot of that is because this, the sales of these firms vastly outstrips them, please. So you know, an alternative measure would be to use sales and also to think about sales relative to the kind of industry you're in. So the work that, um, that, um, that, that David and, and myself and others did about oh, just over a year, published just over a year ago, tried to document that in terms of using US census data, so the kind of population of all firms in the US and you know, have a, a, the simple type of measures of concentration, which is things like the share of sales in the top four firms or Herfindahl indices. So these are based on uh, four digit industries. So you know, quite narrow industries like synthetic cement, um, maybe not narrow enough, but you know, re relatively narrow. Um, across the whole of the US. And there's so, you know, say for manufacturing, there'll be about four or 500 different industries and these are weighted average changes of concentration. So you can see, you know, no matter which broad sector of the economy that you look at, whether it's retail, wholesale or manufacturing, so finance, you know, too big to fail, you, you might think it's happening in banks. These are where a lot of the GAFAM firms work and services, but even in more traditional industries like retail or manufacturing, you see on average this kind of, important increase of, uh, of concentration. So this is this was partly, in fact, we've updated this work and these trends seem to, seem to be continuing. Um, is this just a US phenomenon? Well, the answer is no. So if, if you do a similar type of analysis in Europe, this is from the OECD's multi-prod database, 
also using, again, population, census, and initial data, you also see uh, these increases of, of, uh, of market concentration, all, you know, albeit the data is over a slightly shorter period of time. There's also some very nice work uh, by the chief economist team in DGCOMP, which has looked at, this is kind of publicly available data on companies in the private and public sector from Orbis, uh, combined with some other data sets, which enables you to uh, split out the sales of them more accurately across industries. These are the five biggest economies in, uh, in Europe over the last 20 years. And again, you see the share of the, the largest firms seems to be increasing in the industries over time. Um, and then, uh, you know, so you know, we could go on, but this does seem to be, you know, a phenomenon which is, which is kind of common across many, many countries. Now, of course, it has to be emphasized industrial concentration is not the same as market power. Um, you know, really, if you want to look at a particular antitrust market, you want to use a, a better defined and typically narrow antitrust market. Some very nice work by Ben Cardital, which has tried to do that in, in retail, uh, taking into account local competition. Um, we'd also want to take imports into account. There's some nice work by Meaty and Heist trying to do that in, in the US. But fundamentally, you know, it's very hard to define, define markets. An alternative way to try and think about uh, how this might relate to some measures of market power is to look at price cost margins. So I'll do that in a second. Before I do that, I just want to um, mention a couple of other dimensions of firm inequality rather than size, and also show you that these have also increased. So this is, um, this is the standard deviation of uh, labor productivity in the US um, over time from John Holteranger's work. So you can see from 1996, there's been general increases of labor, the dispersion of labor productivity. This is work, again, from the OECD, looking across 16 different OECD countries, looking at the kind of 90-10, the differences between the top and bottom 10% of firms in terms of productivity, either TFP or labor productivity. Again, these seem to be increases. And this is brand new work with Jan Deloka that I've been doing uh, on the UK um, on for the Deaton Review. So, um, you know, what this does, this is kind of looks at the trends, but looks at the median firm in terms of productivity. And this actually mirrors what's happening in the agorist economy to some extent in the UK, that there was after the Great Recession, there was this big fall of productivity. And for the median firm, basically, there's been no change of um, productivity over this, this kind of 20 year period. All the increases of productivity are happening towards the top of the distribution. And the firms at the bottom of the distribution are actually, you know, if anything, reducing the having lower productivity. So big increases of dispersion, again, for productivity. And then finally, for wages, um, this goes back to some US work um, from Song et al in the Quality Journal of Economics. This is looking at change of different parts of the distribution. And the, the red line shows you, the, the blue line shows you what's well known. There's been this big increase in inequality. People at the top have had big increases. People at the bottom have had just about no increases. But the news in this paper is that if you split this out into what's happening within versus between firms, all the difference of increase of inequality, and this is the uh, red line, is happening because the differences between firms are getting bigger. If you look within firms, inequality within firms has been completely flat, apart from at the very, very top, which is basically the CEO. So this is, again, saying if you want to understand inequality, you really need to understand what's happening between different firms and what, why, uh, why such an inequality has been increasing, this version of firm uh, performance has been changing. Okay, so that's a, a few facts just on the, on the differences between firms on those dimensions. Let's talk about markups. Now markups are of course harder to measure than things like concentration. Um, so uh, you know, there's a couple of different approaches. One is a demand approach. So you can actually try and estimate the demand equation and with a supply assumption, back out what marginal costs are. You know, uh, this is kind of the very low uh, BLP, type of, BLP type of approach. Um, but if you want to do that, it, you can't really do that to describe the whole economy because we just don't have brand specific prices across a wide ranges of the economy. So the alternative approach is based on a more production function based approach. Uh, Lee Vinjig off uh, work by uh, Robert Hall uh, back in the 1980s. And, and the idea here is that we can use the wedge between the output elasticity for a factor of production, a variable factor of production, if you want to add measure price to, to marginal costs, and its share in, in total revenue. So, you know, if, if, if it's perfect competition, then the 
output elasticity is equal to the factor share, that's the kind of solo 57 result, but to the extent there's a wedge between that output elasticity, the technological elasticity, and the share of um, the factor in revenue, that is going to be a, that's going to be an indicator of what the, the, the markup is. So we can do this in different methods, through accounting methods or through econometrically estimating production functions, uh, uh, a la Deloka and Varinsky. Um, but you know, whichever way we do these, we, we, the, the following patterns seem to be coming out. So this is um, Jan's, Jan's kind of QJA paper um, showing uh, on Compistat, which are popular listed US firms, what's happened to estimates of the markup, and they've increased from, say, you know, from 20% to 60% in terms of gross markups since the early 1980s, so the same period when concentration rose. Um, you know, you might worry a lot about using um, publicly listed US firms because you know, they're only, they only cover about a third of all employment and they're very selected. Um, but if you do the same type of analysis on census data, this is from uh, manufacturing, for example, in the US, then you actually see uh, a qualitatively similar pattern where since the early 1980s, you've had quite a, a, a large increase of the, the aggregate markup. So it's worth emphasizing this is the kind of aggregate markup, the size weighted markup. If you looked at the individual firms and looked at say the median uh, markup in the median firm, that's actually remained pretty flat. Um, in many other sectors, you know, this is manufacturing, other sectors that has actually uh, fallen. So what's happening here is this phenomena where there has been this reallocation of activity towards the larger firms who tend to have higher markups. So part of what's going on here, there's some, there's some increase in markups for the top firms, but the bigger phenomena here is that more of the economy has shifted towards these superstar firms who are very high, who have very high markups. So, um, you know, we also, this is again from this new work on the UK, we document very similar things. In the UK, we can look at both listed and unlisted firms. And although, you know, consistent with what I showed you before, the unlisted, the smaller firms have low markups, there's positive trends of markups, uh, weighted average markups in both of these groups of, both the groups of the firms. And then finally, you know, looking more broadly, again, drawing on you know, Yan, the two Yan's work, uh, using listed firms across a number of different parts of the world, you can see that these increase of markup seems to be happening not just in North America, but in Europe and Asia and many other parts of the world as well. So just to take stock of where we are, it looks like industrial concentration has risen, especially if you use sales. Markups over marginal costs seems to have also risen. And this seems to be driven by this, primarily by this reallocation towards the larger firms who generally have larger markups rather than a general rise of markups across all firms. And this has happened not just in the US, but also in other countries, other recent countries like the EU. So, you know, just to think about, you know, is this, is this a, a good thing or is this a bad thing? Well, of course, it depends on what the underlying forces are. Um, on the positive side, these superstar firms are more productive. So the reallocation towards them, should it be a beneficial thing for, for productivity? Um, these superstars are not classical monopolists. So if you look at, say, the industries which, be, which are concentrating more strongly, these are industries which actually seem to have um, a greater rate of innovation as measured by patents or R&D or, or citation rates and patents. The productivity has also gone up more quickly in these industries. Prices haven't gone up more quickly in these industries, as, as you might think from, you know, think about, you know, Google or Facebook, many of these, these, these products are, are, are free. So these are not, these are, are, these are not classical kind of monopoly industries which we think are slow and sluggish. Um, a third advantage of, uh, of the superstar firms, and this comes out of recent work with Mary Amiti, uh, Konigs and Cedric Duprez, is that there appears to be positive productivity spillovers from these firms onto other firms. So uh, if you look at the multinational literature, a lot of the benefits of multinationals are not just because they're more productive, but because when they um, form relationships with other firms, they help spread their productivity through technology transfer. And we kind of, um, we've done some recent work, which is just fresh off the press. This is on uh, Belgian data, where we can actually see the population of all sales between all firms in the economy. And what we show is that here's one bit of evidence of looking at an event study when a local firm starts um, trading with a, a superstar firm, there appears to be quite a big increase in the productivity. So this is the, there's no pre-trend. When you start uh, selling to a, a superstar firm, you get a big increase of your productivity eventually of about eight to 10%. Um, so this is one of the ways in which um, these type of firms create benefits, not just for themselves, 
but also for other firms in the economy. To some extent that, we should also be aware of the cost. So, you know, um, you know the fact that larger could give them the ability to exercise market power and lead to negative outcomes. Um, there is a question of the extent to which have superstars attained their size due to the exercise of this power. Um, and even if they're not, now they have this, this power, are they becoming better at creating barriers to small arrivals? So this, although there's a positive relationship with things like patents, could these patents be used to create barriers to the fusion of, uh, of new innovations and productivity? Could they be lobbying to change the rules of the game? Could they be using little tax arbitrage to, to avoid paying taxes? So those are all um, things that we'll, we'll come back to at the end. I want to talk about now about the implications for labour markets and inequality, which is uh, an important thing to, to actually, I think, link to what's happening in the product and labour markets. So let me just give you a little bit of a framework for thinking about this. So um, the model I'm going to show you is a, is a, is a generalisation of development of the model that we presented in the QJ paper. So there, and we'll continue having this, we'll have heterogeneous productivity, as we saw was first order. Work going to allow some, for some market power. Firms are going to be facing downward sloping um, product demand curves. Um, we can model this in different ways. We have a nice, relatively simple monopoly competition type of framework. But what we'll add to this is to have labor market power. So firms are going to be facing upward sloping uh, labor supply curves. So one way to model that is a kind of wage posting monopsony type of model or um, monopsonistic competition type of model. And this now builds on this kind of large literature, really exciting new literature emerging, which tries to bring in the imperfect competition in the labor market and the product market together. So I mentioned several of these papers, most of them are empirical papers, which are kind of documented evidence for important elements of uh, monopsony power, weight setting power that firms have. And of course, this builds on an earlier literature which has tried to put these things together, but more in the kind of bargaining framework, like my job market paper uh, back a few many years ago. Okay, so let's think about this type of uh, a model. So, you know, in, in the model we write down, the kind of static first order condition with respect to labor um, is gonna yield a, um, a labor share of revenue, which is, is gonna depend on three, uh, three parameters. So you know, this is gonna be payroll relative to value added. This is gonna be the, the share. Um, so there's going to be three elements. One is a kind of technological element, this output elasticity with respect to labor. So, that, you know, if we had perfect competition in, in factor markets and output markets, uh, these would be equal to one and you would just get the classical solar result of the share of labor and value added as equal to the output elasticity uh, with respect to labor. But then the second element, and this was, you know, already in the original, the, the original paper, where we have a markup term of price over marginal cost. So to the extent that you have a, a, a wedge between price and marginal cost, this will tend to reduce the uh, labor share because uh, you know, wages are an important part of the marginal cost. And if you increase your mark up, this is going to shift the labor share downwards. And of course, this will generally depend on the uh, own and cross price product uh, demand elasticities. And the new element is having this kind of inverse markdown parameter. So think of this as the marginal productivity of labor with respect to the wage. Uh, the side parameter, and this monopsony power will depend on the firm's labor supply elasticities that it faces. So um, you, you know, this could come from the fact that workers value the amenities of firms in different ways. You know, they may be living f further or far away from different firms, or that they might have different values on the amenities that, um, that the firm has in terms of flexibility of when you can work, and women that might be particularly important for. But in any case, this will drive this wedge that's kind of marked down uh, between the MR, the marginal revenue product of labor and the wage. So if we think about the change of the labor share from an individual firm I, you can just write this as the change of these three different parameters, the technology parameter, the mark up parameter, and the kind of mark down parameter. Then the final thing we need to think to, to take this to the kind of you know, industrial macro data is the fact that the, um, the, think of this as the economy wide labor share will depend on the firm's labor share multiplied by the relative size of that of, of that firm in the, the market share of the firm. So this is important because what it means is that changes of the aggregate labor share depend on changes of the firm size distribution and the covariance of firm size with, with the labor share. So if the environment changes, so maybe platform competition becomes more important or these fixed costs become uh, more important um, to favor superstar firms. This can depress the labor share without necessarily even changing any of these in individual parameters. So it could be that what's happening is just the, 
you know, uh, movements of activity of market share to the firms which already had had high had, had low labor shares, for example. We, we kind of show there's some evidence for that in the in the US data. Um, why does it matter if the labor share falls? Well, you know, one reason it matters is of income inequality. Since most people's income comes from the labor income, if the share of labor income declines, this is going to have a direct effect on overall income inequality. So there's a you know, clear link there. So what's happened to the labor share? Well, this is what's happened in the US since the Second World War. You can see after the stability, this kind of Caldor fact, from the early 1980s, this started to fall and fell very dramatically in, in the 2000s. Um, the labor share has not just fallen in the US, it's also fallen in Japan and China and in Germany, the other three largest countries in the world. Um, this is what's happened in the UK. Um, so you can see that there's been a general drift down in the UK, although not for every period. And I'll mention why that might be later. Um, so what we've done in, in this uh, new paper with, uh, with Jan is we've tried to actually apply this framework to thinking about the UK. So if we think about the change of the aggregate labor share, it's the change of the elements that I just showed you. If uh, let's just take a first uh, a first stab at this, and let's say that if technology and markdowns were constant, we can take the, these out of the brackets. Then the only thing which would be driving the change of the labour share is going to be what's happened to the aggregate markup. So in the UK, as I showed you earlier, the aggregate markup's risen. It's risen by about 0.4 percent per annum over this uh, 81 to 2019 period. And that implies a fall from this formula of, of the labor share about seven two percentage points. Now, in fact, in the UK, uh, our, you know, the estimates are, that we made are about half that. So the labor share hasn't fallen by as much as you might think, given the change of the, the aggregate markup. So in the context of, um, of, of you know, this kind of framework, that must mean something has moved in the other direction, at least in the case of the UK. So um, either monopsony power or technology. So you know, one story is that technology could have changed towards labor. This is pretty unlikely. If anything, we think that automation has meant uh, things have got worse for labor rather than better. So Joanna Samoglu, you know, my co-author and colleague has argued this. Um, but one thing which may have changed is monopsony power. So could there be smaller markdowns over this time period? So the, the most obvious reason why that might have happened in the UK is that there was an introduction for the first time of, of a national minimum wage in 1999. And what this diagram shows you is that over that period, the bite of that minimum wage, this is the min relative value of the minimum wage compared to the median uh, hourly earnings, has become much stronger. So the UK now has one of the toughest minimum wages in the OECD. So you know, to the extent that a minimum wage um, weighs against monopsony power, this could be one of the this could be the reason why we haven't had as big a fall of the, uh, the labour share in the UK as we have had in the US. And, you know, some evidence for that uh, work I did a few years ago with Steve Machen and Mirko Draker, which actually looked at the impact of the minimum wage of microdata, and this is consistent with many other studies now, including, you know, famous ones by David Carr, is that, you know, minimum wages tend to increase, increase wages, they don't tend to have such a big effect on jobs. But we showed that they did squeeze profits quite significantly. So, you know, this, uh, you know, this is, is consistent with maybe understanding why there might be this countervailing force. Okay, at a given time, I'm going to skip, skip the next slide and just get on to the conclusion, which is about an assessment of what's been happening. So I, I gave you these three broad explanations of what might be happening, institutional factors, technological factors, and globalization. The, the fact we see qualitatively similar patterns across countries in terms of markups and and concentration suggests that there's some underlying forces. So I think it's unlikely that country specific institutions, such as weaker antitrust enforcement in the US, the dominant explanation. So if you look at the European Union, no one's arguing, I think, that GD comp has got weaker over time. People complain it might be too tough in you know, some of the firms, but it, no, nobody's saying it's got weaker. So I think although these might help explain some of the different magnitudes, I think the fundamental story can't really be an institutional story like declining antitrust, given the similarities we see. So I think it's much more likely the main explanation are things like technology stories, what's happening in the sectors intensely producing digital, like the GAFAMs, and this adoption of um, intangible capital, which are high fixed costs in the, in, the, in the intensive digital using industries. So what does this mean for policy? You know, knee-jerk reaction, which is to say we're going to break up these firms or make the smaller is likely to be quite costly. But you know, even if the superstar success is not due to weaker uh, antitrust institutions in this winner-take-all world we live in, 
it's going to be very important to modernize these antitrust policies. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, going forward, we have to be very alert to the potential harm. So, you know, thinking of ex-ante regulation, such as the EU's Digital Markets uh, Act, thinking of um, trying to have more of a role for thinking about future competition and merger decisions, not just looking at current uh, market structure, but how market structure is going to change and how innovation might change has to be a critical part of a, the merger assessment standards. I think the standards of proof need to shift more to when dominant platforms acquire um, smaller startups that could be competitors of the future. Uh, at the moment, especially in the US, the burden of proof is too much uh, on, on, the, on the regulators. And finding ways to increase structural competition, such as through the EU single market, I think are all the critical things. Um, and the other kind of policy th message, I think, comes out of some of the work we've been doing on the UK, is that it's really important to have labour market policies and labour market institutions, which can form a counterweight to some of the power of the superstar firms. So things like minimum wages, collective bargaining, having you know, labour standards, such as in the gig economy, is really important, strengthening job mobility and, of course, human capital as a way of counterbalancing some of the power, which is uh, on, the, on, the, on the very largest firms. So in conclusion, uh, you know, I want to you know, hope to stimulate thinking and thoughts and research is that we see these growing differences between the top firms, the superstar firms, the rest of the economy, as, may, as indicated by increased concentration of markups. Um, I think it helps explain some labor market phenomena as well, such as a changing labor share. But we also need to consider uh, labor market institutions when we do that. Uh, in terms of the overall uh, explanation of this, I think that technology is the dominant factor, especially in the digital producing and digital using sectors. Although I think that, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in thinking about, well, in certain sectors and other kind of factors, could globalization institutions be important in understanding you know, the change that have taken place over time. So I think it's an extremely rich area for those of us who are interested in the digital economy. Lots of work to do and uh, an exciting time to, to do it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John, uh, for this very uh, uh, stimulating uh, talk. Um, yes, to answer Jacques' question, the, the, we, we have uh, time for, for a, a couple of questions. If I may, if I may start, I mean, I, I haven't seen any question in the chat, um, but uh, oh, okay, well, actually Jacques has a question. So uh, Jacques, do you want to ask your question? I was gonna, I was gonna ask something similar. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, John. This was, uh, it's great, and it's great to have an overall framework to think about those things. Dere uh, Nasemoglu, okay, stresses a factor which you, you kind of mention only briefly and not at all in your assessment at the end. But we should pay lots of attention to the nature of the innovation in automation and in robotics, and in particular, whether it's a complement or substitute to labor. Uh, and, but you don't mention this at all in your conclusions at the end. So do you disagree with Darren's analysis or do you think it's something which is you know, beyond what policymakers can do or uh, no, what's happening here? No, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, th I think it's, 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 it's an alternative explanation of what's been happening. It's a drone's argument in the, in the terms of the framework I put down is that it's the, well, the alpha parameter in some sense. It's the, yeah. uh, it's the technology which is changing in a way which is against labor and the automation factors are the things which are pushing down the labor share and they're not being compensated by the what he calls the reinstatement effect of new new skills and new jobs being created so i think that's an you know that's a certainly a hypothesis on the table um and uh you know it would imply you know, imply that some of the you know the other elements are not being measured correctly and that is the thing which is which is going on to change to change what's happening you know um i you know I think that there is a role for, for sure, and I agree with Jerome that um, you know, we've, we've talked about this and argued for this, is that it is possible to change the direction of technical change to influence that. And I think we should try and do that. We'd like to have technical change which are more pro-labor than anti-labor. And in the same way, we can direct technical change to some extent in terms of you know, climate change and green technologies through carbon tax and other things. I've argued for that. I think it's possible. I think it's still an open question how, how able we are to do that though. So the elasticity of 
policy with respect to change the direction of technical change to be pro labor I think is a is, is a difficult what is a difficult one and maybe it's possible and I, I think we should work more on that I haven't seen compelling evidence to that so that's a very strong effect and you know I it, you know it may well be right maybe it is more to do with uh, robots and other things than it is to do with the product market changes that I've been emphasizing more um, you know the, the robot story that one of the issues with it is that it's a relatively small fraction of the economy so if you look at robots as the share of overall capital are pretty tiny so you have to argue it's a much more broader type of automation type of thing so i see that as a you know an, as an alternative hypothesis hypothesis to understanding what's going on and certainly something where you know it, the, the, there could be a lot more interesting work to be done yes i, I also have a, a question uh, I, I just wanted to react on one point you mentioned on the on the last slides on um, you know the the labor market intervention, like you're talking about uh, policies such as raising the minimum wage. Um, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to see how that could, um, how that could, could improve things if, if we think of superstar firms, because they, they are very productive. And from what I understand, they, they pay their workers quite, quite well on average. So uh, I'm a bit surprised because it doesn't seem like the minimum wage would be binding for, for those guys. So, so what am I missing here? Uh, well, I, I, th I, th I think it's a, it's a more subtle thing than just saying it. it's going to be against the superstar firms themselves. So I think it's more that there's going to be equilibrium effects in the entire labour market, at, you know, potentially, not necessarily, but potentially, uh, as you get to a, an economy which is more dominated by a smaller number of firms. So I think that uh, is like can, can can in principle lead to a situation where wages are falling below um, marginal revenue products. So another way to say this, I think in general, you know, and this is channeling Alan Manning, wages are generally set below marginal revenue products, um, and you know, having institutions like the minimum wage could be ways of trying to keep wages at a level above what those those might otherwise be now that's not to say that's the right policy for every country so in france for example i think the the minimum wage is already pretty strong but an economy like the uk which is a very weakly unionized economy with quite liberal liberalized labor markets the equilibrium wage is likely to be pretty low were it not for these other interventions like uh, like the minimum wage so i think you know it's as ever it's going to be different sets of institutions are appropriate for different countries but i think that those uh, those institutions have a, have a have a role to play uh, as we as we go forward okay and there, there's another question by uh, ellen ralston uh, ellen do you want to open your mic and, and ask the question um sure um thank you very much it's very interesting um but i was just wondering if there might might or might not be a, a long-term impact of the stronger labor policy so we see very few super giants in, in Europe. And um, do you think the labor policies are a factor? Yeah, so I have to, I have, I have to apply what's called the cross paper constraint. <laughs> so I have a, I have a, I have a paper uh, with Philippe Aguillon where we looked at some of the French labor market institutions and there is clearly um, an impact of them, especially when you get above 50 employees in the labor market regulation, those uh, tend to have an uh, impact on, you know, discouraging firms to grow above the 50 threshold, um, and also has a negative effect on innovation. So I think that there are some negative effects. Whether, you know, well, well, the other thing we do find in that paper though, is that they tend to affect the incremental innovations, but not the radical innovations. You know, if you're gonna be big, you're gonna be big. You know, paying this extra stuff, paying some extra cost of regulation is not something which is going to be a large effect on preventing you from being large. So, so my, 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 my feeling is that for at the very top, the more radical innovation, the more important stuff is not fundamentally held back by um, labour market regulation. But it certainly is something to be aware of. I mean, I'm not arguing that all labour market regulation that we have is, is a good thing. I think you have to think about the way to do it in a, in a smart way. It has to be combined with other kinds of policies. But I do think there is a, is a role for um, labor standards and regulation. I think particularly in parts of the economy now, which are becoming very fragmented, like in the gig economy there, I think having, having some minimum standards is, is quite important. 
Okay, um, thanks a lot, John. Uh, thanks again for this uh, terrific uh, presentation. Uh, now it's time to, to move to our uh, second keynote uh, speaker. So uh, our second keynote lecture is by uh, Giacomo Calzorari from the European University Institute in Florence. So not only is Giacomo a TSE alumni and a great economist, but he's also at the forefront of a super exciting research agenda at the frontier of economics and computer science. And he will talk today about product recommendation and market concentration. Giacomo. Let me just uh, set these things. Here we go. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Excellent. Very good. So let me start uh, really thank you, thanking you a lot, uh, all the people organizing uh, this conference. I'm uh, and thrilled and honored uh, to give uh, this talk today, uh, in particular being a talk in uh, uh, memory and honor of uh, Suzanne. Um, so let me also say that uh, this is a joint work with a great uh, group of co-authors. Uh, I want to mention them, uh, Emilio Calvano, uh, Vincenzo De Nicolò and Sergio Pastorello. I think it's difficult to, uh, to, to think about a better group of co-authors uh, and the friends with whom to make uh, research and have uh, great fun. So what I'm going to talk today is, as you see here, product recommendation and market concentration. And uh, uh, in fact, it's uh, uh, the topic, it's uh, part of, um, sorry, just a sec, it doesn't, more year ago, it's part of uh, a broader research agenda we have been uh, working on for quite a bit of time uh, on artificial intelligence and implications in uh, uh, on markets. Uh, so we all know that AI is already impacting uh, markets, and we are all excited about the marvels that AI is uh, showing us the great successes. Uh, but at the same time, I think we all share somehow worries about potential uh, consequence. Something can go wrong. We have in the back of our mind this idea. So it, with this research agenda, what we do, we want to uh, better understand how AI, uh, once embedded into markets, may actually work and what could be the consequences. And, and we think this requires to somehow bring together uh, computer science uh, and uh, economics. And uh, the way we do this is uh, by studying actual AI tools in realistic economic environments, like uh, what we did in a series of paper on uh, AI and algorithmic pricing. Um, so more to the topic of today, I think we all agree we have experienced as consumers uh, that nowadays we have an immense set of alternatives uh, and most of the alternatives are unknown. Think about the products you could buy, uh, the news you could uh, uh, read, uh, the movies, uh, the songs, the financial assets to buy, uh, the posts in social media to read, and the academic paper to read as well. So there are really many, many alternatives. Let, let me get, just give you a couple of examples here in, uh, in digital platforms. Uh, currently, in the US, uh, in Amazon Marketplace, you can buy more than 300, diff uh, 300 million different items. And on Spotify, you can listen to more than 90 uh, million uh, of songs. And the national catalog of Netflix is uh, several thousand uh, movies. Uh, without speaking of YouTube, the videos of YouTube nowadays are uh, more than 26 billion. Now, um, Clearly, we would never be able to explore these uh, oceans uh, of, of alternative. Uh, there are too many. And even if we were able to somehow become aware of the existence of these alternatives, we wouldn't know what would be our preference or tastes with respect to these, uh, these products. So we need some help. So let me go on with this maritime uh, uh, metaphor. In this ocean, we need uh, a new sextant uh, to navigate. What is it? Well, one possibility is precisely a, a one remarkable application of artificial intelligence that is uh, the rec recommender systems. So recommender systems are uh, software programs that are specifically designed to provide personalized suggestions uh, to users and consumers about uh, 
possible items and products they may uh, try. So they are designed, in fact, to solve a prediction issue, uh, predicting users' preferences for unknown items. Uh, and they do this based, uh, using some assessment on other users and items. And in fact, in computer scientists, science, they are called collaborative tools. I will uh, come back on this uh, important element. So as I said, it's an application of AI that uh, quite remarkable and already uh, uh, quite common in markets that mediates the interaction between uh, uh, consumers or users, uh, producers, that is items, and in, uh, in between you would have uh, platforms using recommender systems. So um, why do we care about this? Well, uh, we do care because already nowadays, recommender systems are having a huge impact in market. So in, in, in the examples I was, I was giving uh, before, Netflix, Amazon, already there, a large fraction of choices, of actual choices of individuals are um, uh, generated or induced by uh, suggestions of recommender systems. If not the majority, uh, look for example what happens in Netflix where 75% of the movies have been recommended. So they're already impacting quite significantly markets and there is a general worry about uh, algorithmic uh, recommendation. So there is a heated debate, policy debate on uh, the risk of competition of these tools and even the risk of the, for democracy. And this has been debated uh, on both sides of the oceans, uh, the European Commission, uh, the US Congress, FTC. Uh, there are several papers by national competition authorities. Uh, and there is an idea there that we may risk what is called rich get richer effect. That is, recommender systems may end up exasperating popularity. There are some papers in computer science that somehow pointing to this, to, to this risk. So actually this uh, rich get richer effect is in part related what, uh, to what John was mentioning before on, on Superstar. So in fact, you see that uh, we are very complementary in, this, in these two talks. Of course, I will take a very much more micro perspective here. Now, um, this rich get richer effect uh, may be caused by an important and essential element of uh, AI algorithms once they are deployed in markets. And that is the fact that these tools, these softwares need to be trained and actually retrained over time on data, which once they are in the, using in the market, uh, they themselves contributed to generate. So in economics, we would say that we have a big endogeneity issue here. So the general claim is that um, recommender systems may reinforce market power, somehow amplifying competitive advantage. So we decided to look into it. And this is our research agenda on recommender systems. So we think there are a number of questions, important questions to look at. So First point, our recommender system, just another example of uh, a technology that reduces search costs, like what it was internet at the very beginning, or is there something, something specific and different and new? Our re recommendations that uh, users obtain from recommender system biased and will, as I said before, dominance of some sellers and products be further reinforced by our recommendations. And in the end, what is the ultimate impact on competition and market power? Now, there are uh, different approaches that you may want to use uh, in order to address uh, 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 these questions. Uh, of course, the one approach is to look at the problem uh, from the theoretical point of view. And this has been done by a series of very interesting paper, for example, uh, associating recommended system to a co search cost reduction, uh, or looking at the possibility that the re recommendation could be uh, uh, somehow steered or manipulated, uh, like for example, in the case of self, self, self uh, uh, preferencing, sorry. And you may see here in this, in this list of quotas, a big bunch of uh, people from, from Toulouse very active on this topic. Or a recommender system can be also seen 
from the point of view of information design with the tools of Bayesian persuasion. So these theoretical approaches are very useful, very important, but of course I might, might make the claim uh, that this is not enough because they are using a very, very stylized version of what is a recommended system in reality. And to some extent, they are missing this collaborative uh, element that I will mention uh, further in a moment. You can also try to use empirical work uh, on actual algorithm. Here, there are some papers doing this, uh, uh, studying the cau uh, causal effect of algori algorithms in, in individual choices. Then the difficulty is that is, uh, there are rare uh, possibility to obtain uh, good data and it's difficult to generalize what you can get from the, this specific case. So we took uh, along the line of uh, the uh, uh, general approach and agenda I was mentioning at the very beginning, uh, the idea of uh, exploit is studying this problem with an experimental approach using realistic simulations. And it will be uh, more clear uh, um, in a moment. So uh, what we do essentially in the, with this research agenda is we operate actual uh, recommender systems in synthetic and controlled environment. Synthetic means that we generate preferences and products and controlled which means that we can control the data on which the algorithm is trained. Now this approach has to at least two important challenges that we have to uh, take care of. The first is that algorithms must be sufficiently similar to those that are used in actual market. And the second is that also the economic environments must be sufficiently realistic. So the intended contribution here is uh, first methodological, as I said, bringing or bridging economics and computer science uh, and 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 we do we try to do this using sound economic models, as I said, with realistic AI algorithms. And the second uh, contribution is more specific. We want to study the links, as I said, between user items, recommendations, and the implication for broader market competition. So let me give you a general idea framework uh, to uh, that is useful for a recommender system. So imagine an environment where a uh, capital I users, capital J items, and a rating matrix R, which is I times J. You have an example here, very simple examples. There are four items, A, B, C, D, and there are four users, one, two, three, four. And the content of some of these cells tells you, for example, is two A, so the number four tells you what is the rating that user two gave to product A. So the uh, rating matrix in fact contains some observed ratings that we call Rij, the rating that the uh, user I gave to item J. Now, typically, so you can think this rating matrix, like for example, in Netflix, uh, the, the items are the movies in the columns and, and the users are the viewers in Netflix. Now, in reality, these rating matrix are huge. As I mentioned, we have thousands of movies, uh, thousands if not millions of uh, viewers. So they are very large matrices. And, and this is the most important element, is that they are sparse, actually very sparse, meaning that the uh, cells that are non-blank, uh, uh, non-empty, are in between depending on the different environment from 1% to 10%. Now the problem of a, a recommender system is actually predicting the missing rating. So fill in the blank and make then a personalized uh, recommendation. So uh, now let me tell you how a uh, state-of-the-art uh, algorithm for recommendation works in a nutshell. So what I'm gonna present here is what is called model-based collaborative, collaborative filter, filtering. So four steps. In the first step, the recommender system assumes some parsimonial model of the rating, uh, assuming certain number of factors, let's say K. For each factor, there is a usual dimension, dimension that we indicate here with theta i h, which is the proclivity of factor age for of user i. Okay, and the item dimension 
beta jh is the intensity of factor h that is present in item j. So these models don't use any semantic meaning for the k factors, but if you want to somehow have an idea, so theta can be the taste for sugar, the content sugar of individual i, and beta j is the content of sugar in product j. The second step, once we have this model in the recommended system, is to actually estimate uh, this uh, uh, user dimension, an item dimension factor, the theta et and the beta et. And this is typically done by minimizing some accuracy loss on the observed rating, of course, the non blank cells in the rating matrix. Now, once you have recovered for any user and any item this theta et and beta et, you can impute all the missing entries by simply making a vector product between the estimates theta and beta. So I can get, even if user I never tried uh, uh, item W, I can reconstruct the estimated rating for uh, this pair user and item. Then step four, once I fill the blank of the matrix, for each user, for each row, I can order the ratings and recommend to the user I the product that has the highest, uh, the highest rating. That's the functioning of uh, a, a, a recommended system. You may have noticed that the problem is in fact uh, similar to what is called in mathematics matrix factorization. The only difference is that matrix factorization we normally use, uh, so we generally use complete matrix. Here we start from an incomplete matrix, but we ended up with two matrices the user matrix and the item matrix that are of a smaller size. The important thing to notice here is what I was mentioning before, the collaborative component of uh, this matrix factorization. So in fact, what we are using in these recommender systems is uh, uh, user and item uh, correlations. I think this is a simple, in a sense, obvious uh, observation, but it's important because it's telling you the recommender systems are not just another example of a reduction in the cost of search. They are adding in this uh, uh, search process a collaborative uh, component. Um, okay, now uh, let me tell you about the economic uh, environment. Um, as I said, we are controlling and this is our uh, uh, general approach in our research agenda, we control preferences. So we design preferences in the following way. Um, we assume exactly the same uh, uh, preference model as the uh, algorithm in order to eliminate any uncontrolled bias. So in the end, we are gonna use a random utility model with logic errors that where the utility of user I for uh, item j at some period t is the vector product of the parameters theta and beta plus some error. And we design the uh, 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 consumers, the, the taste of the consumers, that is the theta, by unpicking them in a way that I'm going to show you in a moment with an example. And similar we do for items. So we design products that are substitutes by uh, picking uh, the betas. And we will, I will show you results on uh, cases of pure horizontal differentiation or a pure vertical differentiation where there is a, there's going to be one product that is the best product in the market and uh, some mixed version in between. So for the moment, we will abstract uh, from prices. So products will be associated to firms, but these firms for the moment are completely passive. And the baseline environment I'm going to show you is on 100 users, 100 items, and uh, two factors. Um, oops, here we go. This is an example of pure horizontal differentiation. Uh, what you see here in this graph, each one of these uh, brownish dot is one item associated with the two coordinates, that is the beta, uh, the content of these uh, uh, I think with respect to the two uh, dimensions, beta one and beta two. Okay, so you see the 100 products displayed uh, uniformly over this uh, uh, arc of a circle. And you also see a map of indifference curves of a consumer that has some uh, ratio 
of taste uh, parameters, theta one and theta two. And as you can see, there is just one in this economy, just one product that is the ideal product for this individual. So in this example of pure horizontal differentiation, what we do, we make sure that for each user, there is in the market one preferred item that the user, user may not know, may be unaware of, and vice versa. So the experimental protocol that we use, and then I will come, uh, I will go soon uh, to show you some of the results. The experimental protocol is the following. We study a repeated consumption environment and recommendation where uh, for, for 100 period, periods, from one to 100. Um, and at any point in time, we, in, in our protocol, we do three things. The first, we update the rating matrix. That is, we add for each user i the item of one and only one i. Uh, sorry, the rating of one and only one item. Which one? Hold on, I will explain to you in a moment. The second step that we do is we estimate. So we feed into the algorithm the updated rating matrix R t, and the algorithm will give us the uh, uh, complete R at matrix. Uh, 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 rating matrix, and then third step, we, rec we do the recommendation, uh, recommending the single best product to each one of the users. Now, how do we update the rating matrix? We do this important step in, in two ways. The first way, as uh, it would happen in reality, uh, we add as a rating the observed utility for user i, item j, and period t of the item that this user was recommended in the previous period. And the second way we populate the rating matrix is by exogenous data. So the utility of an item that was taken uh, at random. And I will clarify in a moment why we are doing these two uh, different exercises. And we run this procedure, this exact procedure of a 100 period for 1,000 sessions, and I'm gonna show you the, the averages. Now, it's an important caveat here. You should note that what we want to do here is really to understand the properties of the rating uh, systems, uh, the recommended system. And hence, we don't want to have biases embedded in our analysis. So there will be no room for steering recommendation here. And users will follow recommendation and will, they will truthfully report ratings. Probably is not very close to what happens in reality, but this is the only way we think in order to understand properly what are the characteristics of these uh, AI algorithms. Last point, we need a benchmark to compare with. And the benchmark we're going to use is uh, uh, something that is standard in economics, is an individual search benchmark, where at any point in time, the individual uh, randomly samples among the products and observes the associated matched utility. The individual then perfectly recalls past observation and then chooses what is the best option across all the observed utility. And you see as time passes, individual uh, individual search have, have done more search, the consideration set in this benchmark becomes larger and larger. And similarly, on the recommender system in the recommender system case, the rating matrix becomes less and less sparse. So here we go uh, into some of the findings. Um, I'm going to show you first a set of results with exogenous data. So data are populating the rating matrix uh, exogenously with random dots. And then I will sh show you what is the consequence instead of having endogenous data. So what you see here is a quality of the recommendation. The left uh, panel is the case of horizontal differentiation. The right panel is the case of vertical differentiation and mixed differentiation in the middle. So what you see here is a measure of uh, normalized utility of our users um, in expectation. And the red line is the benchmark of the individual search. And the blue line is the recommended system, as I said, with exogenous data. Now, there are two. Uh, uh, so there will be a series of this type of graphs. So I want to clarify there are essentially two important parts uh, to look at in this figure is the first uh, 10 periods. And the reason why these are important is that they correspond 
to a level of sparsity, which is close to the reality. And also you may want to look at around 50, the iteration 50, because in that case, it's somehow signaling and showing us what are the limit properties of the recommender system, although in, an, in a, a level of sparsity that is not very realistic. So first observation here is that uh, the recommenders, uh, the utility with the recommender system uh, is uh, higher, tend, tend to be higher than in the individual search benchmark if the rating matrix is not too sparse. For example, here, the uh, benchmark does better than the recommended system. And this may reflect what is called in computer science a cold start problem when there are uh, too little data. And the second effect is that as you move from horizontal toward the vertical differentiation, you see that the recommendations becomes better and better, better than the, the benchmark. And, and it, the idea is there that when you go to vertical differentiation, since the recommender is exploiting similarity and since with vertical differentiation, consumers tend to agree on what is the best product, there you have the recommender doing a better job. Now look at what happened on market concentration. And this goes back uh, to some of the uh, comments uh, and, uh, in, in John's uh, talk before. So we look at uh, HHI index uh, of induced market shares in these two environments with individual search and with the recommender system. And you see systematically that the recommender system, the blue line, generates substantial increase in uh, uh, concentration with respect to the benchmark. Um, and this is, uh, can be observed also if you look at the uh, uh, number of products that receive non-zero uh, market share. With the recommender system, there are fewer items that get positive uh, market share than with respect to the individual search. Uh, and uh, with the horizontal differentiation also, uh, selling firms uh, change something that you don't see actually in this figure, but we observe that uh, the firms that have positive market, market share change over session, but still we can observe some of the firms in the population of the firms that are favored. And within session, period after period, there is some persistence uh, that we think it's important to document. Now, if you look at the market share of the dominant of the dominant firm, well, here the recommender system does a good job. In the case of horizontal differentiation, there is no dominant firm, uh, and, and hence the recommender system, as the individual search benchmark, uh, cannot find a, a market a dominant firm. But if you look instead at vertical differentiation, uh, the recommender system does a much better job in identifying the superior products when they exist. Okay, now, uh, so uh, summarizing, uh, uh, we have seen that recommender systems uh, with exogenous data increase concentration. And per se, uh, for us, this means that there is a bias in the algorithm. I will come back on this. As I, as I said before, some of the concern about uh, recommendation and this idea of items becoming more popular and popular with this uh, cumulative feedback loop that creates entrenchment, uh, we want to see whether uh, the fact that the reality data are endogenous may uh, actually play a role in addition to the bias in the output. Uh, because if this is the case, we can say that there is also a bias in the data, which is the part that has been uh, mostly emphasized, uh, for example, uh, in the computer science literature. So what you see here is the uh, HHI index, the Erfindal, Erfindal index uh, on concentration. The novelty is the greenish line. The green line is the HHI index when the recommender system uses endogenous data that itself created, contributed to create period after period. So the punchline is that perhaps concentration slightly increases with endogenous data. So remember, you should look around this part here in the first 10 periods in order to have a realistic uh, sparsity of the data. But certainly it's a second order effect with respect to the bias in the algorithm that I was uh, documenting before. So let me summarize the findings so far. So far, uh, recommender system may help consumers 
especially when we are talking about uh, products with vertical where vertical differentiation is important and the matrix is not too sparse. They generate significantly, uh, uh, they induce significant increase in market concentration and the worries on cumulative feedback generated by endogenous data is not really supported by our analysis. There are two more steps I want to cover. The first is, well, as John was saying before, uh, concentration is not bad per se. So it's really an issue, this increased uh, market concentration. And the second step is, uh, where does this excessive concentration come from in the end? So we want to unpack this bias that I was mentioning before. First point, is concentration bias an issue? Well, we know that uh, it depends on competition. So we may have highly concentrated market because there are few lucky firms that for some you know, random stories, no particular merit, get market power, or it could be that the market is very competitive and selects the, the best firms, as John was saying before. Now, what is the effect of recommenders on the implied intensity of competition? So what we do to address this question is uh, measure the intensity of competition in our environment with the implicit Nash equilibrium prices that could emerge as an equilibrium at any point in time. So at any point in time, we take the demand that are mediated or generated implicitly by the recommended system, and given this demand, we calculate the uh, static Nash equilibrium prices. And we do so uh, similarly for the individual search benchmark. So our Nash equilibrium prices are, are our inverse measure of competition. And you should notice that we are not having, not using strategic firms here. They're not forward looking. Remember, we are using this price measure as an inverse measure of competition. So here is what we see. So what you see here is for the individual search, the recommender system with endogenous and exogenous data, respectively the green and the blue line, the weighted average Nash equilibrium prices. So there is a first clear and first order effect, the recommender systems intensify competition, prices are significantly lowered. Prices also reflect concentration bias, as you may notice in this first period here. Um, and data also have a rich effect on competition because uh, the perceived differentiation reduces with high sparsity. I will come back on this uh, uh, comment later on. And again, the endogenous data, again, is not particularly related. Now, last point I want to cover is we observed uh, biases in the algorithm, uh, but now we want to know more. And we can do more because we are controlling the environment. And that's the, one of the plus of our search agenda, I think. We want to know whether the, cause, the causes of algorithmic biases, bias are due to failure in estimating product characteristics or consumer preferences or potentially both. And this is what we do. So I'm going to present uh, uh, the, uh, our results here with, uh, uh, sorry, oops, this figure here, which shows you uh, an example in the case of horizontal differentiation with exogenous data at period uh, 10, that is when the uh, rating matrix has a sparsity around uh, 10%, or the non blank uh, cells are around 10%. So, what you have here is the entire economy that we are studying. The red line is showing you uh, the true item and users, and they are uniformly distributed over the red line. Okay, as I said before, in the example of horizontal differentiation, all the rest is the estimates. And in particular, the blue disks are the estimated, if you want, consumers. It's the estimated pairs of data for each one of our consumers. And the dots are the estimated items. So that is the uh, estimated products, items, the beta. And you see the market share with the uh, green the, uh, sorry, with the gray disks. So clearly, this shows you a very important, we think, a, a, well, a, a clear pattern. Uh, we observe three est systematic estimation bias. 
First, consumers are bunched together. Remember, consumers should be spread over the right circle while they are here all bunched together in this part here. Items as well get bunched together. Instead of being, again, over the red arc, they are in this area here. And third element is that some items obtain overstated or too high quality. And these are the guys here in northeast direction. Those guys have higher betas, and as a consequence, they promise higher utility. And as a consequence, they will be recommended more by the recommended system. Now, notice that bunching together consumers and items would in general increase competition, okay? Because there is a reduced differentiation. But on the contrary, having some products with overstated quality may actually reduce competition. Now, uh, I'm close to uh, conclude with my talk. Now, how robust are uh, the results? Um, concentration bias, prices, and the unpacking that was showing you of these different prices. So we are uh, doing a lot of robustness check of uh, this uh, research. Uh, we have worked on very large matrices. Uh, this is an important step because remember, it's not only a matter of the sparsity of the matrix that should be closer to reality, it's also a matter of the number of parameters that the algorithm has to uh, estimate uh, relative to the number of the observations. So with the large matrices, we are accounting for this. We are using uh, categorized ratings where the, the content of information that uh, uh, the rating is to the matrix is coarser instead of utility, just for example, the five star uh, matrix uh, that you have in Amazon. We are studying the role of um, um, hyperparameters and cross validation, which is one way to select the hyperparameters uh, that use, it's used in these uh, algorithms. Uh, we are studying the consequence of uh, possibly misspecifying the model. Remember what I showed you before. The economic model, the number of factors, was exactly the same as in uh, what it was in the model of the algorithms. We are studying the possibility that the algorithm, instead of recommending just one product, recommends, let's say, for the first five products, the first 10 products, and then the consumer chooses among them. Uh, we are studying other market reaction, not only pricing, but also the possibility that if you, as a seller, never are able to sell for over time, then you may exit the market or the market may attract some new firms. And we are also studying what happens if users, certain users have a different amount of ratings. Uh, we think this is important because this type of ability to control the amount of information for a given users may allow for uh, a discussion on the, the debate on data portability on platforms. And the last point is that uh, uh, we, would, we are uh, investigating what happens reco with the recommenders that comes with some constraints. There is an interesting recent article on a the AI magazine, which is the uh, magazine of the Association for the Development of Artificial Intelligence. These are uh, computer scientists, where they recently mentioned that they focus so far quite a bit on uh, consumer-centric recommenders. And in fact, remember, our recommender system are minimizing this accuracy loss in terms of the match value for the consumers. And, but they say we could start thinking more about also the side of producers or some more exoteric stuff like a serendipity, which means uh, somehow giving the users the impression that they were able to discover something while instead, in the end, it was the recommender that uh, recommended the stuff. So concluding, um, first of all is, uh, let me say again, that it's a preliminary uh, work, uh, but I think there are some important takeaways of, uh, uh, interesting takeaways of this research already. Uh, the design of actual recommender systems contain biases. They generate homogenization on products, and tastes, consumers' taste, and this has the potential of increasing competition, I was saying before. They tend to overstate quality of some items, and this has the potential to reduce competition. Um, 
all these biases, they go in one direction in terms of concentration, they, go, they increase uh, uh, concentration, but overall they also increase competition, as I showed you before. And the last point is that the general concern of the feedback loop, the diabolic feedback loop, that is the bias that endogenous data may generate, we think received, at least for what we have seen so far, too much emphasis. And it turns out to be a second order effect in our data. So if I want to summarize uh, our findings, well, I, I think there is a kind of positive message here. These algorithms have biases. But these biases are uh, uh, not unavoidable, like it would have been if they were based on endogenous data. Uh, there are biases in the algorithms, and the systematic biases that negatively affect, in the end, one of the players, either the consumers or some of the firms, could be, in the end, eliminated. This is our approach, our view as economists, by future better algorithms. And let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Giacomo. Um, so, so far there, there are no questions in the chat. So, so let, me, uh, let me ask you one question. So actually it's maybe more of a clarification question. C can you go back to the, the slides where you were uh, trying to see what are the, the, the effects of, uh, of recommender system on prices and explain a bit the mechanism. I didn't get the, the mechanism through which prices are reduced because of recommended systems. Yeah, okay. So uh, the demand here for the recommended system is uh, the demand that is implicitly generated by the recommended system, okay? So uh, we're gonna use a, a, a utility that is a, the estimated utility minus the price. So this is the net utility that's gonna be the uh, element to form uh, uh, our demand. So with this uh, uh, demand, we then calculate the Nash equilibrium prices and we compare the Nash equilibrium prices with the, that emerge within this procedure with the recommender system with uh, the same procedure that would emerge with the, uh, the individual benchmark, okay? So, uh, the, the first of important observation is uh, that the combination of the uh, biases that was mentioned before actually reduce uh, the prices, the equilibrium prices, which for us is a, a measure, an inverse measure of competition. So uh, the, in other terms, the biases that are embedded in the recommender systems induce uh, more intense uh, uh, competition. Or if you want, the implicit demand elasticity are higher uh, in this case, in the case of uh, the recommended system. And, and the point is that, uh, as I said, it, or it's the third bullet here, uh, there is a complex uh, here combination of uh, the uh, biases, the three biases we mentioned before, actually later in the talk. Um, the bias on uh, uh, homogenization of items and products, and also the bias on uh, the, the vertical dimension. Since products are bunched uh, very much together, uh, they are perceived as more homogeneous, and this very much increases uh, the competition. Okay, uh, Amelia Fletcher has a, has a question. Uh, Amelia, if you want to ask it. Um, so you said, I mean, I think it's really, really interesting work, fantastic. Um, but you said that you had completely abstracted from behavioral biases, but I, it struck me that in the computer science literature, it's those behavioral biases that quite often drive some of the data biases. So for example, the fact that when people do reviews, they tend to review things they loved and things they hated, but not things they just kind of feel okay about. Um, and that creates a bias in the, in the data that is collected. Um, do you, I, mean, I have no doubt that you're gonna go on and look at this sort of thing, but do you think that you might be missing some of the data bias effect by excluding and abstracting from those behavioral biases? And therefore, do you think it might be a bit early to make a call on that, on that particular point? 
Thanks a lot, Amelia. Thank, thank you. Uh, very to the point. I agree. You may have noticed that there are no policy conclusions here. Uh, and and uh, that's certainly too early. And, uh, and um, so really, our impression reading this literature on computer science is that they did a lot of stuff, uh, but in a no, not very well controlled way, mixing too many things together. And uh, for us, it is very difficult to understand what's doing what, what's causing what. So really, that what we are doing here is first step into, and we wanted to have everything clean and understandable uh, piece by piece. And it's only by doing this that we are able here, for example, to disentangle these three elements. Then I completely agree with you. Uh, there may be other biases in the data. One bias is that recommendations do not come, uh, uh, you know, they, they have certain patterns that have been recognized. Uh, I completely agree with you. And uh, for me, the implication of this is that this is going to be a very long line of research. Okay. Uh, let's let's see. Uh, so we're a bit over time, but uh, th th there's a couple of questions. So um, let's take one. Uh, Hesky has a has a question. Hesky, do you do you want to open your mic? Sure. So I mean, Amelia is sort of focused on the the consumer side of this. I'm a little bit more focused on the producer side of this. And it's easy to imagine that the kind of recommender system affects the behavior of, of firms. Here, you know, when you've taken firm behavior, you've just taken sort of static Nash pricing. But, but one could easily imagine sort of bait and switch type, type things where I built up a reputation to then milk it. Now, maybe that building up the, the position in the algorithm early on intensifies competition. I, I mean, that the, the Complicated things to, to think about, but again, this sort of speaks to um, uh, there's a big agenda <laughs> to, to, to uh, conduct on this. Thanks a lot, Aski. In the, the interest of time, I will uh, thank you for, for this comment. I agree with you. Uh, just notice that uh, the Nash equilibrium prices we are not using as a description, the real description of behavior of the firms. There is a way to manipulate the recommender system. If you drop the price, you will be recommended more. This is already happening in the reality. We really use it in order to calculate the implicit associated uh, intensity of competition. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Giacomo. So I received a couple of uh, questions in, in the chat, in a private uh, chat, uh, but uh, as you see, uh, we're already uh, almost 10 minutes uh, past the, the scheduled time. So uh, I'll send Giacomo the, the, the questions uh, and send you the answers. Um, so let me, let me thank again, John and Giacomo uh, for uh, uh, great presentations. Uh, let me thank all of you for attending. Uh, we had uh, more than 100 participants, so, that, so that's great. And uh, let's hope that, uh, we already said this last year, but let's hope that next year we will be able to, to see you in person uh, in January. So keep an eye on, the, on your mailbox for, uh, uh, on your email uh, for, for the, the call for papers for next year. Thanks to you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Giacomo. Thank you for organizing it. <laughs> <laughs>